Let's start with another topic that seems to have really reared its head as topic A this week, and that is the immersion uh, of, of Dominic Pooney. This guy is getting broken down by Jeff Schwartz in, you know, 10-minute-long uh, videos. I've seen a few Brian Baldinger breakdowns, and it really feels like not only, you know, all of NFL media, I'm sure the 49ers themselves are very much looking at this young man as their starting right guard right in week one. It looks like it's Pooney time. Pooney, the po get ready for the Pooney push or the Pooney pirouette or, uh, I mean, he just... He's the real deal, man. He's the real deal. Um, you know, he's just a he's just a fun loving guy who loves to play. He plays with a joy. He loves the contact. But you know, the thing about offensive line play, it's so hard to get these guys from college to the pros. I mean, Shanahan kind of addressed it the other day when I was asking him about it. And he's like, you know, in college, they just play different schemes and it takes a long time to transition linemen from the college game to the pro game. And some guys don't transition smoothly. And you know what this guy did um, in this game the other day where he stepped on Colton McKivitt's foot by accident and then saw that because he had stepped on Colton's foot, Damon, that Dave, that uh, Colton couldn't kick out <clears throat> and block his guy. And what did uh, Pooney do? He just kind of reverse footwork and picked up um, Colton's guy after after he kind of blew by Colton because Colton's foot was anchored to the ground because it was stepped on by Pooney. So Pooney, I mean, the awareness there for a rookie. To, I mean, we just saw the Niners get overwhelmed on an offensive line situation in the Super Bowl, and it cost them the game. And here it is, this kid's second professional game, and he steps on one of his linemen's toes and has the a wherewithal to to spin out and try to try to block McKivitt's guy in as a result. I mean, that was so heads up, so heady. He loves to be violent. He loves to dominate. Um, I think this is going to John Lynch said the key phrase plug and play. So they're looking at him as a guy that, you know, maybe um, doesn't get challenged all year. Feliciano's not going to challenge him early. Burford's hurt. Looks like the right guard job's his. I think so. And I'll tell you, watching that Jeff Schwartz breakdown, really good breakdown, a lot to learn, just offensive yeah. line technique where these guys are, you know, just, you know, from the ground up offensive line play, there's an awful lot to learn in there. One of the things that Schwartz keep on kept on returning to was the extra work. You know, it's not just Pooney looking to block his assignment, but when his assignment's taken care of, he picks up that extra work. He's preventing quarterback hits just by being aware and keeping his head on a swivel. And once his job is done, he's looking for, as Jeff Schwartz said, extra work out there. So if you've got a guy who's doing his job and as a rookie is already helping other guys look better at their job, you're not only talking about a guy who looks like he's ready to start against, you know, Quinn and Williams week one of his career on Monday night football. You're looking at a guy who seems to be the heir apparent of best offensive lineman. This team has the minute Trent Williams decides I'm all done here. Like that's sort of the trajectory of this kid's starting career. And it's hard to get excited about guards. It's hard to get excited about offensive line, but it's something that 49ers fans have been concerned about rightfully so for the past couple seasons. This kid looks like the real deal, man. I think he's going to be the answers to an awful lot of the questions that this offensive line has had. So I, I think watch all of a sudden Colton McKivitz get better playing next to this guy. Um, It's even, in a, and it really is part of a larger theme, which is that the 49ers this off season went into the draft, even though they didn't invest in a, you know, a lot of people wanted them to invest a first round pick in an offensive lineman, um, but they didn't. And they didn't invest a second round pick in an offensive lineman, but they, eventually got to it and they addressed it twice in the draft with Pooney in the third round and then Kingston uh, from USC in the sixth round. And then after the draft, they signed Drake Nugent. Well, those three guys, Pooney has allowed one pressure in 44 pass blocking snaps uh, to begin his career in two games. And that's after he didn't allow a single sack over his final two years at Kansas. Jarrett Kingston has allowed one pressure in two games thus far, and that's over 61 snaps. So Kingston's been really, really good. And then Drake Nugent, 
Uh, the, the Stanford, by way of Michigan uh, Center, allowed zero pressures on 29 snaps against the Saints. And in two preseason games, Nugent has allowed only one pressure on 60 um, pass rushing snaps. So, you know, Nugent is taking on Zakel for that backup spot to Brendel. And who knows how that's going to go. But uh, Nugent's obviously playing well, even though uh, Zakel's in the lead right now. Um, according to the depth chart, Pooney looks incredible and Kingston, you know, has been playing guard and tackle and there's a lot of people that really like Kingston. So, you know, it, it, the Niners may still not have their replacement for Trent Williams and their O line still is a work in progress. But as you can see with the secondary, these things don't take, you know, you don't build these positions up in a day or even a single draft or a single year takes a couple of years and they've started, but it looks like they've added three pieces, one starter and two guys off the bench that they can plug in right away. And that's exciting. Little stock up, stock down this week. I don't think anyone's stock has risen or done better than Dominic Poonies. Jacob Cowing might be the second candidate up there, Larry. I mean, it's, you know, you never get a second chance to make a first impression and he made a very good first impression on just about everybody. I'm guessing poaching staff included, he took what has been flashing on the practice field into a game against the Saints. I think that that's good news for him. I'm not going to turn around and translate that into bad news for anyone else, IU Pearsall or anything else. I just want to look at this positively. But Jacob Cowing seems to be a rookie that should the ball come to him during the regular season, he might actually do something with it. Yeah, I mean, I, I said it a, over a month ago that I, I I prefer, if you said to me, who's more likely to make an impact um, on the 49ers, Cowing or Pearsall, I'm going Cowing. And the reason I'm going Cowing is that there's more there. Like, you know, with Cowing, he's got legitimate 4-3 speed and the ability to separate. And then he's played in two offenses and was prolific. And he played with some really, really good players at at Arizona. Uh, the receiver that he played with last year, McMillan, is going to probably wind up being like a top five pick in this in this next draft. So, and yet Cowing was the guy. He was the guy that stood out in the last couple of games they played. He was the guy against ASU. Um, he was the guy in the bowl game against Oklahoma. Um, he, you know, to me, Cowing is a route runner. He's dependable. He's got speed. There's just a lot to hang your hat on there, where with Pearsall, he's got great ball skills, and there's a good catch radius there. But what makes me nervous and always has is that there wasn't awesome production at Florida. Now, is that the quarterback's fault? Possibly. Is it is the offensive, co offensive coordinator, head coach? I mean, there's other people you can blame. But when you're, when you're a future NFL receiver of note, you probably should dominate in college and he looks good, but he didn't dominate. So um, to me, that's reason to kind of pause. So we'll see what Pearsall is. And I think Pearsall is going to be effective, but I like cowing better because I think cowing is more dynamic and he, he gives the 49ers. I mean, Pearsall, when's Pearsall going to be on the field? Right. I mean, well, I mean, here's seriously, the thing. I don't, J, I don't JJ's hold, not, I don't want to hold, against a guy what we don't know about a guy because we haven't even seen him yet i mean and you've been at practice almost every day larry you haven't seen much of ricky pearsall in terms of live drills with contact he's been you know on the side for the most part or just running in in shorts and t-shirts so we don't know they've what been protecting him all summer they've protected him all summer he no. hasn't been in the one-on-one -on -one drills so he isn't going up against this bevy of good corners the Niners have for the most part. He's been in the blue non-contact jersey, so he hasn't taken these hits that I'm not sure if he can take. So I, I, I like Pearsall, and I think there's reason to think that he can be an effective NFL player, but like Cowing did it at UTEP, and then he went to Arizona in a different offense and did it again, and then went to the combine and ran 4-3, and you know, has that ability to separate vertically. I, to me, he's a little bit more of you can see his skill set on paper and why he's effective. Um, we'll see about Pearsall. We'll see. Hey, and and it doesn't sound like we're going to see in week one.
Uh, little little stock up, stock down continuing. Again, there's no doubt that Cowing and Pooney had a good week. I think yep. that Josh Dobbs had a good week in the eyes of the team, in the eyes of the coaching staff. And let me ask you, since you've been at practice, obviously Purdy runs with the ones. Uh, has Dobbs been getting the lion's share of the work with the twos, Larry? Has he been uh, get, getting more work than Brandon Allen? And is that an indicator as to a decision this team is making at QB two. No, I mean, in short, I mean, no, he hasn't been taking all the two reps. Uh, they've been splitting them up most of camp. Um, I would say that uh, Allen is probably slightly ahead of Dobbs based on what I've seen in practice. Now, a lot of people really liked what Dobbs did in this last game. And to me, um, Dobbs, really has had a nice preseason. I mean, the first game he does the helicopter dive and kind of shows that he's all in. And that's something that would, did not go unnoticed by his teammates. That was really cool. And then this last game, um, you know, he, he really, he moved outside of the pocket. Uh, he showed that mobility. He made some plays. He threw the ball better in these two preseason games than he's thrown it on the practice field all summer. Allen has thrown the deep ball much better than Dobbs in this camp. But um, I think Dobbs has outplayed. I mean, I thought Allen outplayed Dobbs in the first game. Dobbs probably outplayed Allen a little bit in the second game. Um, I think I would still give Allen a slight nod going into this third game, but it's close, man. It is really close. And then the question becomes, whoever the loser of this competition is, do they automatically make the team as number three? Or do they then get put through waivers and only make the team as a practice squad quarterback? Like, like I, I'm not even sure if there is a competition between two and three. Like, I mean, I know there's a competition between there's no competition for the number one job. Brock Brock's. There's no competition. I don't I, I think there is a competition for, you know, the number two job between Dobbs and Allen. I don't know that there's a competition for that number three job because I get the feeling that the Niners may go with, you know, let's just say Allen and Purdy, put Dobbs and Mordecai both through waivers to try to see who slides through to the practice squad. And whoever goes unclaimed will be on the practice squad. And whoever, if they both go unclaimed, then they'll pick between the two of them. Um, that That's that's my, my guess on how things are going to go. But... Um, I, I have a hard time seeing with the 49ers needing that 49ers have like seven or eight really good corners and they cut their corner depth last year into Sean Jameson within three weeks, they were looking for more corners and they needed corners all the way going into the playoffs. So let me um, ask you, this. Do you think, I do wonder you think if they will cut their depth, their corner depth, or if they'll retain their corner depth. And that's going to mean, you know, really going lean and mean at all these other spots and the quarterback could be one of them. They might go with two and the third guy in the practice squad. I really don't believe that anything that we see Friday night on the field at Allegiant Stadium is going to go a long way into getting a guy on the team or off the team. I think that the decisions have pretty much been made across the board. Do you think there is a QB2 battle that could, could play out on the field? I mean, do, do you think it's been made up in Shanahan's mind? Or do you think something could happen in a Legion stadium that puts Dobbs in the QB two role or Allen over Dobbs in the QB two role? If that's where he's been to begin, you know, I, I think that no, I think it's still, I think it's, I think it's still open. I think you it's do? still open. And I do, I do. And I think that, um, that there's a financial component here and then there's a roster component here. And a lot of times it's not about who, you know, who are the best 53. It's a lot of times are who are the, the 53 guys you want to go with because the four guys that you chose to cut are all going to go unclaimed and you're going to be able to have those guys too. You know what I mean? So it's like a lot of times when it comes right down to, you know, roster spot 51, 52, 53, it's like, okay, well player X or player Y. Well, player X is more likely to get picked up off waivers. Oh, really? Okay. Let's go with, let's go with player X then. You know, just keep him off waivers. Um, so that could be it. And and like like in this situation, if you really want to make sure that you have Dobbs and Allen does beat him out, 
do you put them through waivers and try to get them to the practice squad? Or do you just say, you know what, if I put them through waivers, Minnesota, who lost McCarthy for the year, might grab them. And who's more likely to slip through waivers at this juncture, Dobbs or Mordecai? I would say it's probably Mordecai unless Mordecai goes off in this third game. It's really not the game you want to be playing. Like, if there's a player that you want that you think is going to be an important part of your year, you don't want to be playing that. Hopefully we can slide them in the side door without anybody noticing. Like, that's that's, that's a little bit This is the game that these teams all play, though. You're right. I mean, well, I mean, like last year, Deshaun Jameson had a really good camp, and he was a really good solid corner option for them. They cut him to go with an extra offensive lineman that they never, ever would have played Matt Pryor. They added Matt Pryor who couldn't play dead to the roster. They went with Matt Pryor over Deshaun Jameson. And then literally they were picking up Logan Ryan types all year, all year looking for one more corner, one more corner. Because when you way, Logan Ryan when you run out of corners, you run out of corners. Yeah. Um, Logan Ryan got picked on in the middle of the field in the Super Bowl, and that's what Diamador Lenore was saying. Maybe I should have been playing slot in that conversation that he had with Richard Sherman just about a week ago. Uh, stock down this week. Is there anyone noticeably being left out of practice reps because you can feel their careers in real time slipping off the back end of this roster larry what's it like uh been this week for for ronnie bell demetrius flanagan fouls cody schrader a couple of guys who didn't have great games pre-game season two or pre- yeah pre-game, i mean pre-season game two yeah i mean i don't have any sources i'm just giving you my impressions right because like nobody's told me these guys are in trouble or anything but i think cody schrader went from the beginning of camp like, man, I'd be really be af- afraid to squeeze him through waivers to I think he gets through waivers. He's just not quite NFL at this juncture. He went for 2.1 a carry, not behind a great line, and a lot of it was the line's issues, not him. But you're just, it's there's too many guys here. I mean, you got CMC, you got Mitchell, you got Mason, you got Husechek. Those four are going to make it. And you probably got one spot for for either Brita, Schrader, Garendo, Patrick Taylor, or Keyshawn Vaughn. And it's pretty clear the way, you know, Garendo was getting coached up on the sideline yesterday by Bobby T that it's Isaac Garendo week, right? They they need him to fire, play well, and show up big in the in the in that game against the Raiders. If he does, I think Garendo gets the fifth and final running back spot and Schrader goes through waivers. So I would say Cody Schrader on the offensive side is the guy who, you know, I don't want to say the blooms off the rose, but you know, it just, he's, he's, he's a nice player, but he'll I think he'll squeeze through waivers. Okay. So that, that's the first one on the other side of the ball. Um, it's a little bit more difficult to say somebody is, is, um, sliding or, or struggling in any way. I just think that the roster, certainty of Demetrius Flanagan fouls, who's a solid player across the board, solid backup, solid special teamer. But I think his job is under fire here. Why? Because you got Fred. He's not going anywhere. You got Devondre Campbell. You brought in. He's obviously going to make the team. So you got those two guys for sure. Curtis Robinson has is easily won. He's, he's easily won the most improved player in this camp. I mean, he's he looks a lot like Fred Warner out there. So he's making it. And then, and then Jalen Graham has been just a f- absolute phenomenal uh, player all summer. He's making it. D. Winters is making it uh, because Winters, you know, according to Fred, had the best offseason of anybody. And then Tatum Bethune has got 18 tackles in two games, and he keeps showing at, up at the football in, in camp, and he just does nothing but make tackle after tackle after tackle. So I just think it's going to come down to I think they're going to keep six. Fred. Devondre, Curtis, Robinson, Jalen Graham, D. Winters are your five. And then I just think it's going to come down to Tatum Bethune or Flanagan Fowles, and I'd rather go with Tatum Bethune. I, you know, I know Flanagan Fowles a little bit better in coverage, but Tatum Bethune, um, you know, to have 18 tackles in two games when he barely knew, knew the defense. I mean, Curtis Robinson said it yesterday at the podium when I asked him about Bethune. He's like, 
the fact that this kid has been able to learn this defense this fast and adapt to it and lead us in tackles the last two games and and just be all around the football all summer just shows what what kind of a smart instinctive player he is so Bethune doesn't does, does not run well but you know what you wouldn't know that watching the film because he's just always where he needs to be so um, I think uh, Flanagan fouls his roster spot. Very, very precarious at this yeah. point. Yeah. Look, point. I mean, hey, there's a difference. There is a serious difference between speed, speed, and football speed. And we see it all the time. You know, guy has a lousy 40 time. Well, then you put him on a football field and pads around everyone, and dude, he's cooking. You know, you just, it, it, it Talano Hafanga is an all pro. He right. ran four, six, seven. Um, you know, JJ JJ uh, Juwan Jennings might have been the MVP of the Super Bowl. He's on a team that has Ayuk and Debo and CMC, and yet and yet JJ who ran four seven six for the stopwatch. Right, that's like a parked car as a wide receiver. By the way, that's not a good number. <laughs> it's like an offensive tackle. Right, he's like he's like getting blown by by a alt from the Chargers. Yeah, so I mean, it's 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 an amazing thing. Sometimes your numbers, you know, Jerry Rice. By the way, I mean, mayonnaise we're, got we're, it right Jerry here. Jerry Rice, there, check it out, mayonnaise right here. Jerry Rice ran a four seven one. Yeah, what that I don't need, to do. I don't know. I'm not sure if that was quite that slow, but still, he, nobody ever caught Jerry from behind, and he didn't have anything close to a sub four five forty. So forty time is overrated, uh, very overrated. Brock Purdy. Has a very marginal forty time, but he's got a one five four ten yard split, which is just a fraction slower than Tyree Kill. Well, guess what? Brock Purdy's hard to sack because he can get away. So, you know that quickness really does does matter. I mean, the forty time doesn't matter for every position. It matters for the positions like, you know, running back, wide receiver, um, corner. You know, where you're you're maybe going to need long speed a couple times a game. 